Hello, Badr. Hi. Well, Thanks Johnny. for coming, man. Thank, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. <laughs> Did you sleep well last night? <laughs> um, I never sleep well. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. I was good. Okay. That's okay. That's fantastic. Because uh, I've been feeling the earthquakes lately, to be honest. Wait, what? What Have earthquakes? been feeling the earthquakes? No. We've been having earthquakes. I know. Like, I've read about them. And I'm like, I didn't feel anything. They're subtle. I feel them at night. They're usually like midnight-ish. Really? One o'clock, yeah. Dang. Yeah. No, I, I haven't. It's easier to feel if you're like in bed and she, yeah, you feel yeah, something. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I mean, I, I, I don't, I try, by the time I'm in bed, I, I'm, I sleep like in two minutes. Allah. Yeah, sometimes I, like, sometimes I, for, like, I don't even have time to put my alarm. I, I, I just fall that. asleep. I wish I had that. It's good and bad uh, because, you know, <laughs> it's not sustainable because that means you're super tired every day, you know what I mean? Yeah, fair enough. Uh, but it does help when you're, you know, like time-wise, you don't have to waste yeah. time yeah. trying to fall asleep. Uh, but that's why I don't feel anything. <laughs> and, mashallah, as soon as I get in bed, um, that's when I decide to wake up mentally. Like, <laughs> I know. All the ideas are yeah, flowing. I, have I, to, I actually have like a book nearby always so right. I can just write something down so I don't have to keep thinking about it and yeah 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 oh that's yeah that's that's a good idea actually. yeah it yeah. helps you get it out of your mind and and yeah safe. I feel like a lot of people play with their phone now which which is cool I guess if you're watching a video it can like you can because if you don't move for 15 mm-hmm. minutes apparently you just sleep mm-hmm. but you have to not move for 15 minutes like absolutely no but minutes. thinking about that makes it harder to sleep yeah 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 yeah, yeah. like if you're sitting there okay I just need to not move yeah it's but a bit move away, isn't it? like I have to start yeah. again yeah yeah, yeah, and then you move one, and then it's like, oh, yep. it's been seven minutes, now I killed the house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's what the military, apparently, they do. Like, when they sleep, they have to sleep in, I don't know, somewhere. Really? They just, yeah, they just put the sleeping bag, and then they just stop. I mean, there's a breathing one also, which I'm not familiar with. Very Like, they, you, you can breathe in a specific manner. That makes you more likely it, to sleep? It lowers your blood pressure. or so. I don't know exactly the science behind it, to be honest. But I know that the 15-minute thing works because I've tried it. Like if you just stay still, you for, just 15, stay still yeah. for 15 minutes, you will, like if you meditate for yeah. 20 minutes, you'll feel sleepy if you don't like move right, your body right, right. way. Uh, anyway, yeah, I'll look into those. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you want to be an astronaut, I feel like that's, that might be helpful. How, yeah. how do you, st- I mean, okay, let me, let me just back up and tell people. <laughs> we'll like, start. Yeah. I'm yeah. like, all of a sudden we're going in space. How do you sleep there, man? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, uh, <laughs> okay. So let's see. You're an engineer. Architect, filmmaker, astronaut, and then you worked at Disney as a Imagineer. Yes. Which I never heard until you came here. Yes. Okay, perfect. Now, I guess the biggest one is, uh, you know, how do you, why, why become an astronaut? Um, I think for me, um, I, I told you, like mentioned earlier, yeah. that, that filmmaking is a big deal for me and films. And growing up, I used to watch movies and think, you know, um, a lot of these movies are interesting and they have interesting stories and I wish that my life could be something like a movie. And that inspired me to think, why can't your life be like a movie? And when I say that, I don't mean that in a childish sense of it's crazy extreme. Mm -hmm. I mean that in the sense of having a story worth telling. Yeah. And I I quickly learned that it's possible to do that and then I became huge, um, like... I had a huge curiosity in history in general, and I saw that you know, lots of people in history have stories worth telling. And one of them was Da Vinci. And I got really into Da Vinci growing up mm-hmm. and the Renaissance man, this idea of doing multiple things and being able to um, have multiple professions and interests. And that sounded so interesting to me. So from that point on, this was really early on, like maybe 15 years old, um, even less in kin. And I just wanted to focus on anything that made me curious and interested. So whether it was art, whether it was film, whether it was photography, whether it was skateboarding, anything in between. It's just something that like I tried things for the sake of trying them and for the sake of the fact that I think it's cool and I want to learn how to do it. And especially the understanding of how the world works. That was something that was always important to me. Mm -hmm. I'm very curious about the line between... Um, there's a certain confidence that people have sure. when they do things. Yeah. Us as like humanity, we just do things. Sure. And it's weird because there's a, there's the plan beforehand and then there's a thing that happens and it's crazy. Like if you look at it, any building, uh-huh. it's insane to think that humans built that. Look at, look at the liberation tower. Yeah. 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 You look at it one day and you're like, it's insane that, you know, 
a person like you combined with a bunch of other people thinking about something and putting the work in can produce that. Sure, yeah. So there's a difference for me between the, there's a know-how of how things come together. And for me, all of these things were fascinating and they kind of culminated in astronauts. When gotcha. I, when I saw what an astronaut was and what it takes to be an astronaut, it made me think that even if I don't become an astronaut, doing this or trying to do this will make me a better person. And it, there's no way trying to become an astronaut will make me, um, a less interesting person. Yeah, yeah, you know uh, what I mean? yeah, definitely. <laughs> so just keep keep shooting for it. Even if it doesn't happen, you'll learn so much along the way. You'll gain knowledge in so many different areas, and most of them have many different talents and are generalists. So they have you know backgrounds in engineering, some military, some are artists, some are um, martial artists. There's everything in between. But what they end up doing is they dedicate their life to science and exploration, and I think that. That's just a wonderful thing. So yeah, the combination of all those things made me really want to be an astronaut. And I had that from a young age, but I never took it seriously until I was able to um, prove to myself that if I work hard, I can achieve the things that seem impossible. Yeah, no, definitely. Let me reframe this in, a sp- in another way, because the barrier of entry, at least, I don't know if it's hard. I mean, it seems hard. It seems, I- I'm sure it's also hard to, to, to be an astronaut. Didn't how come that didn't make you give? I mean, a lot of people want to do a lot of things, but then the barrier of entry is way too high. It's like, oh, I have to do this, this, and then I have to study on that. Mm-hmm. It's just a long journey before you even got a shot at it. A shot, right? How come you didn't give up on it? I like that question because for me, the the actual it's easy to answer that. The, the answer is, what do you lose? You have nothing to lose when you've already lost in in a certain sense Mm. if your goal is to become an astronaut if you don't try you're not going to be an astronaut Mm. end of story sure so you have nothing to lose by trying and like i said there's so many things that you can gain along the way that's separate it's just the idea that um you know if i want to be a great basketball player if i don't play basketball i'm not going to be a great basketball player regardless of Mm. what happens you know so i think for me the easy part is just realizing to myself that uh, if I don't try and put myself out there and, and actually pursue the thing, then I'm giving up anyway. So why, why, like, if anything, doing something makes me feel like I'm not giving up, even if it's futile mm. for now. And the barrier of entry is high. You know, for one, you have to be, if you want to go through NASA, you have to be American. If you want to go through ESA, you, want to, you have to be European. And uh, right now, the closest space agency to us is in Emirat. And for us, we don't have a space agency yet. So literally, I'm saying, I want to do something that has no route, pretty much. Yeah. Because I don't want to be an American. I don't want to go to NASA and be, be an astronaut for America. That would be beautiful. It would be a dream come true in its own way. But that's not what I want. Mm-hmm. I want to be a Kuwaiti astronaut. Because that, for me, has more impact as something like it, it leaves some something it's beyond me it's not just a personal uh goal it will affect people who are coming up the next generation people who can actually pursue their goals as well so for me that seems like a more um how do i put it yeah a better way to focus my energy yeah no you know? definitely yeah uh i mean okay this might seem a bit ignorant from my side but i actually don't Who's an astronaut who's not like who gets because I've read a piece about Jeff Bezos being an astronaut and then like two days later they <laughs> redefined it and then like one day he is he is one day he isn't so I'm not, a, I'm not sure if no, he is. it's a very good point but like yeah. what's what's an astronaut really so and then also what do they do other than ex- do they just explore like what's your function why why do we send you there yeah. what, what's the benefits perfect questions I love you guys so um that one is a very touchy point mm-hmm. the, the first one you brought up so. Uh, for people who don't know, there's this imaginary line called the Kármán line, which mm. is 100 kilometers above the ground, so 100 kilometers altitude. If you pass that line, technically speaking, you're an astronaut. Mm. Obviously, and return <laughs> safely. <laughs> but if you go above that line, you're an astronaut. But, uh, the problem is now you're entering a space and a domain in life, like we're transitioning towards commercial space flight. Mm. 
And that means a lot of people are going, are going to be able to just go to space for the sake of going to space. Sure. For tourism. And that's okay. And I think it's a great thing. I think, you know, we should encourage Virgin Galactic. We should encourage Blue Origin. That's Jeff Bezos' company. We should uh, encourage all of these commercial space flights because it makes space more relevant and it makes it more interesting and accessible. Mm. These are all great things. My, my issue, it's not my issue. I, all the other people have this issue too. And I think you, naturally felt it which is yeah. wait so just going up for three minutes makes you an astronaut you know like huh and the truth is it depends on what your definition of astronaut is if your definition is just someone who went to space and came back sure technically speaking um but you know there's there's a lot of ways to define that technically earth is a spaceship and we're all flying through space on it sure you know so i think for me, what an astronaut is, is someone who dedicates their life to science and the discovery of science and the space, space exploration in general. Mm. So for me, like if you look at, even if you look at the astronaut class that gets selected for NASA, method, when they get chosen, any class, you're chosen Wahab, they're going to choose you to be an astronaut. Now you're going to begin your training. Mm -hmm. There's two years of training that you have to kind of graduate from. Okay. Before that, you're an ASCAM, literally astronaut candidate. But mm. they literally call it. Is that ASCAM. how they call it? They I call it on purpose to oh. make you feel humble. <laughs> you know, like and he, yeah. I know I selected you, and yeah. you're probably gonna end up being. You know, and you, they selected maybe what twelve people out of thousands of all of them qualified applicants. You know what I mean? Oh wow. Okay. Yeah, and you're talking about the elite and right. then even then they take those people and call them ASCANs. you're talking mm -hmm. about someone who has multiple phds you know yeah it, it's meant to make them feel like a little tongue-in-cheek and to make you feel very humble because you you have a long way to go still and you have to learn a lot still before you graduate to becoming an astronaut and then even after you're that, you're that you're actually an astronaut you graduate you become an astronaut but you don't have your wings yet because you didn't go past 100 kilometers mm. so for me i think that's more the, and then there's an, also an, a culture of AI method. I just went on an analog mission where I'm considered an analog astronaut on high seas. Mm. And that's something, an analog mission is where you simulate living li a life on, on the moon or Mars for the sake of like research. And there are a lot of people who do these kinds of missions, but then they go around telling people they're certified astronauts. You know, there's a, there's a line there you should tread. And I think, personally, I don't think it comes from, you know, being aggressive about it or anything it's just simply respecting the profession and yeah you wouldn't go around walking around saying you're a doctor if you're not a doctor sure. you know yeah i wouldn't say i'm a doctor if i'm not a doctor so i have a respect to astronauts and i wouldn't say you're astronaut unless you feel like you're an astronaut and i always tell people you know like a lot of people who find out that i want to be an astronaut say why do you want to go to space mm. you know and i just tell them i don't want to go to space it's one of the things i want to do because i want to be an astronaut I want to live and work in space. I want to do science in space. Sure. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that's a good segue to your second question, which is what do you, what do astronauts do and how does that help us? So right now, I, the ISS, the International Space Station, is orbiting around the Earth. Who at, owns that, by the way? It's an international thing. Like it's who a, pays for it? Everyone. So oh. uh, not everyone, us, everyone, space agency. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, NASA, ESA, the European Space Agency, um, JAXA, Japanese Space Agency, okay. Roscosmos, Russian. Um, honestly, in my opinion, the International Space Station is the most ambitious project, construction project that's ever been constructed, ever. Mm -hmm. And probably the most... Uh, the the thing we should be proudest of because it's such a beautiful combination of multiple countries co collaborating to make something happen. Sure. And you're talking about countries that even on Earth don't cooperate. But once they go into space, it's a different ballgame because they need to begin to um, focus. And I think the further we go into space as a species, mm. the more we become humans and not just like different countries. Can you fight in space? In terms of? Like physically or like using arms? I heard that uh, there was a time where um, there there were some fist fights in space. Like, um, how hard is the fist fight? It would be very difficult. I'm, that's imagine, why they get along very well. I'd imagine it would be very difficult because uh, keep in mind anything you do would just make you. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. But I think um, part of the reason they go through interesting like psychological tests when they select people 
is because they try to pick the best people to spend time with. Mm. And he, right now, it used to be about the, the, the people who had the skills and the people who are daring and a little, you know, risky. Yeah. And they used to default to like fighter pilot types and stuff like that. Still, a lot of fighter pilots are astronauts now, but mostly now they, they have to pass certain requirements when it comes to their temperament, the way they speak to people, the way they interact socially. These are all things. And in the end of the day, it comes down to a question of, do you want to spend time with this person in space? Mm. Do you want to be locked up for several months to a year in space with this person? Wait, really? Yeah. So on the ISS, the typical mission, like average, is six months. So they go to the ISS for six months. Yeah. And the lo- the longest American mission was a year. And, and that was a test, a twin study, actually, twin astronauts. One was on Earth and one was in uh, space. They basically, he stayed one year in space and the other guy was on Earth. And they kind of um, measured the differences between them because they're very genetically similar. But that's something that um, they did to study, you know, the long-term effects of zero gravity so they can prepare for Mars. Mm, okay. So, yeah. But in terms of what do they do in space the international space station is a laboratory okay it's a big lab and what we do is there's a certain percentage and i think the majority of the experiments that happen on the iss are for earth's benefit they're okay. experiments from earth from different organizations and labs and and you know different countries all around the world including kuwait we just recently sent up a uh, cubesat our first cubesat um, they send experiments up to space where they want the conditions of zero gravity to be able to be a variable in their experiment. So it's mm. like, what, you know, methane, can plants grow in space? Right, right, right. How effectively does it affect, you know, how, how much does it affect their growth and the change and all that? So you just send them in a box and then see what happens there? Yeah, well, they take care of them and stuff. So there's thousands of experiments are on the ISS, and it's the job of the astronauts to take care of the ISS, to take care of each other, and to take care of all these experiments. They mm. run the experiments for the people on Earth. Mm. They send them back to their groups. They're like, any yeah, method we had our CubeSat set up by an American astronaut. She did it for us, took pictures and all that stuff, and she set it up and sent everything back to us. They ran the experiment and gave it back. There's so many things um, that we do in space for Earth. But then there's also the stuff that we're doing for outer space. We're doing long, long duration space flight experiments to practice for Mars. Mm. We're doing preparations for the moon. We're doing all these things. NASA recently declared the Artemis missions, which are first missions to the moon that are going to be setting up a station there so we can get to Mars quicker and easier. Yeah. So they've dedicated, like, cost, they've publicly stated that this is happening. We're going to Mars. That's our goal. We're sending people there. And so it's part science and, and learning about the universe and our place in the universe. Mm. Part doing science to benefit Earth and engineering. So we know more about things that we can't test on Earth because we're limited by gravity here. Mm. And then the other part is the sake of space exploration and just expanding and learning more as we go out. And, and we're learning about Mars and we're learning about whether there was water there before, we're convinced there was. Mm. And how did it go away? Like, what happens to a planet that makes that happen, you know? And maybe that helps us understand our future or our past. Yeah. That, that, okay. Let, let's, let, okay. Let me ask you some basic, very basic question. At mm-hmm. what altitude do you lose gravity? Is it the 100? Um, yes. So okay. the reason they decided that the Kármán line was 100 kilometers an hour is because in order to stay above it... What, an hour, you said? Sorry. Oh, uh, just... Uh, okay, l- yeah, yeah. Lamin- sorry, no, I, I misspoke. So the reason they decided the Kármán line was 100 kilometers altitude, altitude yeah. is because in order to stay above that, uh-huh. you need to be in orbit. What is in orbit? So... Oh, say, say that again. Oh, so in order that. to actually stay above 100 kilometers uh, in altitude yeah you have to be in orbit. you have to be in orbit okay and what's an orbit so what makes you in orbit a lot of people have this idea that when you go to space you just go high enough and then you're in space which is technically ish true why isn't because the truth is the earth is rotating and it's also moving uh. and there's a lot of speeds going on so everything is always relatively in motion so what's happening is technically when you go to low earth orbit leo um, that's where the ISS is. 
you're going somewhere where you're still not that you know, you're not that far from earth it's low earth orbit so there's still a lot of earth's gravity affecting you but why are you still in space it's because at that point when you're that high you're actually moving 7.66 kilometers a second in a direction that's basically allowing you to avoid falling back into earth so yeah i got it so yeah. so imagine if you were being pulled back towards earth if if, if this ball was earth mm. and this is you mm. right so you're over here earth is pulling you back but you're moving so fast that way that as it pulls you back towards it you miss and you keep missing and you miss i see and i you got, miss, I got you, you yeah yeah, yeah. so the the more you the, the constant missing of earth as it pulls you back is the definition of or oh. an orbit okay you're now in orbit so you're actually not just in space floating you're moving 7.66 kilometers a second like eastward yeah 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 yeah. you know and you're falling you're constantly falling and that's why they call it microgravity not zero gravity because technically there is gravity acting on you but you're feeling no effects because you're actually just falling inside the iss and the whole iss is falling around the earth but i thought but that's confusing though because if the earth's trying to pull you that means there is a gravity yeah so it's still affecting you but how, well how come like i i thought gravity is just like daira dakhil daira. once you're out of the outer daira, khalas, you're no. out relax it's it's almost like um imagine if you had a sheet of cloth okay okay I don't want to get too much into space time and, and the fabric of the universe and all that, but let's just say you had a sheet of cloth. Sure. And if you put a ball on it, it bends it down. So if you say mm-hmm. we're, it's taut and we're holding it in four corners and you put a ball on it and it goes down the shui, everything's going to lean towards it Yeah. a little bit, right? Because yeah. it has a mass. Mm. That lean that's in everything in the fabric is the gravity that that thing is causing. If you put another ball, mm. there will be another one. So now there's there's like a curve in the cloth صح? yeah between the two equally sized balls now take a smaller ball and put it in the middle the way it kind of navigates to one of these sides is how gravity is everything's always in balance in the universe does that make sense yeah it's a constant yeah, yeah, it makes sense actually yeah it's a constant ballet and da- and dance of gravitational forces okay there is a a speed that you can go at that's called um what do you call it um what does escape it escape velocity Sorry. Oh. Uh, so there's something called escape velocity. If you go, if you reach escape velocity when you're trying to leave a planet, uh-huh. that means you have enough energy to get, to be pulled away from the gravitation of that body. But you're going to obviously enter into the gravitation of something that you're heading towards. And then when we go to Mars eventually, we're going to, or we've, by the way, we've gone, just not people. We've sent probes, we've sent, you know, uh, rovers and everything yeah, yeah. which the rovers are like the size of this room you know they're huge because you send when you send something it's kind of like tossing it and you don't it doesn't fly directly there it's like you leave like if, if say mars is the microphone and earth is here you leave earth at the bottom and with the curve that it threw you at you hit ex- escape velocity around here and then you continue forward and all of this is calculated Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, yeah. Even while you're escaping, you're still kind of curving on the direction that Earth's gravity kind of pulled you towards. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. So you have to calculate yeah. all of that. Yeah, wow, okay. It's always like a balance. You're always being pulled towards something or away from something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, the other day, I I, I forgot who it was. I, uh, I, don't, I, I can't remember the name now, but uh, someone was talking about, like, what happens if the Earth stopped rotating? Mm-hmm. And then the dude was like, we're gonna all die in like a second because we're much. all just gonna be like the inertia would send yeah them, if you if you hypothetically could stop the earth immediately yeah in its tracks everyone on it would oh the grass something the grass right? neil the grass yeah, yeah 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 everything and on the surface of earth would immediately accelerate to the speed at which it was rotating yeah in the direction of like east 
Yeah. So we, all our buildings, us, everything, it would just slide off the earth in that direction. We we'll all slam into each other, basically. Yeah, you'd just rotate. Wait, would we slam into each other, though? 100%. It, w- it wouldn't perfectly... It w- oh, if, if, it, if, it, if, if it could perfectly all move all at once yeah. and not break anything, yeah, but everything's going to break and move and hit and right, stuff. Right, right, so right, right. It would be chaos. It would, yeah. But yeah, that's something that we don't appreciate. We don't appreciate that the relative motion of the earth. So we're sitting on the earth right now and we don't feel movement. Mm-hmm. That's because uh, to us, uh, to us, <laughs> the earth is not moving and it's called relative speeds. Mm-hmm. So it's something that um, Einstein used to bring up all the time with the theory of relativity. So basically your frame of reference defines um, the, the way you measure things. Sure. And if you're on, if you're driving on a car, and you're going 50 kilometers an hour and you have a cannon in the back with a ball in it, a bowling ball in it. And this is an experiment I think that Myth- Mythbusters did. And if you shoot it at exactly 50 kilometers the opposite way, the opposite way it will just drop in yeah. the same spot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Somebody, somebody, and like to you, it would still seem like it went that way. Mm. To the ball, it would seem like you went that way. To somebody watching, it would be like it just fell down. So everyone has a different frame of reference and that's yeah, yeah. an inertial frame of reference okay so now a uh, hundred kilometer away how 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 fast can you get there that's pretty fast that's like what a couple of minutes uh it takes a couple of minutes to the rocket it's not that hard to it, let me rephrase that it's hard to go to space it's it's not that difficult if your if your rocket is working well if you're yeah, if, you're, yeah. if you have a good rocket and it has enough fuel you will get to space rather soon and the even virgin galactic um who they have a different way of getting to space. They have a, a an airplane that flies at a high altitude, then they drop the, the spaceship off of it, and then it shoots. So that way they already pass a lot of the thick atmosphere, mm. so they don't have to go through all of that. And then they rocket upwards towards space, which is a, a different type of method. Because keep in mind, the struggle with Earth is that we have a, such a, a dense atmosphere. And all of that air needs to be, you have to cut through all that air to get to space. Mm. And that's a lot of pressure. That's a lot of heat. That's a lot of um, just resistance in general to get into space. That slows us down. Mm. Even the ISS, which is at low Earth orbit, every now and then has to like adjust, like like fly into adjustments, basically, just because there's tiny particles of air still in the atmosphere like the the edge of the atmosphere that over time slow it down okay i see got you yeah so it's completely different um depending and that that's one of the issues we have with mars is mars has a very difficult atmosphere it's thin thinner than earth but it's not thick so it's not thick enough to to use like parachutes easily like on earth we can use parachutes because the atmosphere is so, so thick, so they actually slow us down. Mm. In Mars, it's, it's too thin to use parachutes reliably. You can still use them, but it's not like going to slow you down as much as Earth. But then it's not completely void like the moon where you can where you can just kind of like, you know, land softly and then leave easily. You still have to have enough power to leave and enough power to enter. And you still heat up on, re- on entry. So Wait, Mars is not like the moon? I thought everything that's not Earth is pretty much the same. No, no, no. Oh, wow. Every planet has its own like ecosystem. So mo- the moon kind of just doesn't have an atmosphere. And even if it does, it's very negligible. So it's basically um, nothing. Like if you were to, like if you've seen footage of the Apollo astronauts mm-hmm. leaving the, the moon, they basically shoot up with a little explosion underneath their lunar rover and it will just keep going up. It's not going to get pulled. Obviously, there's not enough gravity. And it will just uh, go up to the the module that captures it. Mm. Because if you are on Mars, you still have to leave with rockets like we do. Because you have to push oh. through air. And they have dust on Mars. You know? they, have, they have weather. You know what I mean? Like, that's the same with the other planets as well. There's different ecosystems completely similar to Earth in the sense that they're, they're, they have an atmosphere. But they're different in that they do different things. Okay. Wow. Well, okay. Yeah. So now Jeff Bezos is considered an astronaut or not? What By do you think? my definition, <laughs> yeah, he's not. He can say they. I think him and Richard Branson and anyone who um, goes space. I, in my opinion, they're space tourists. Yeah, that's fair. 
Yeah. Best, which is still a good thing. It's cool. Best, you're a space tourist. If you want to, in passing, say, oh, I'm an astronaut as a joke or a technical, technicality, yeah, sure. Best, I think if you personally want to respect astronauts, mm. I think you would just say space, space tourist. Or the same, even, even Methanen, uh, to touch on that point once more, even the Emirati astronaut, Hazza, Mansouri, the, the first Emirati astronaut, he had an accelerated, um, he had an accelerated uh, training. So normally you take two years of basic training and mm -hmm. then uh, at least a couple more on top of that to s train for your mission. He, they, uh, Emirat wanted to accelerate his training. Because of that, um, you know, the definition of his flight for NASA was space flight participant, which is the same as if you were rich enough mm -hmm. and just paid Russia you know, to take you to space, you can do that. If I had billions of dollars and I could pay, you know, 500 or 300 million to go to space, they'll take you and Adi, you'll go to the ISS. But when you're there, you don't do much. You're, you're considered not an astronaut, you're considered a space flight participant. And, um, that when you're there, you're not allowed to do anything. You're not going to touch any of the experiments. You're, you're just there to be in space, you know? And mm. if you want, you can pay more to do with Russia. You can even do a spacewalk. Best, you have to pay a lot of money. Best, to the credit of the UAE, they fought really hard to prove to the United States that they're not in this for just PR. They're in this for the long run. They're in this to be in space exploration. They're in this to... How? By just sending... They did it, first of all, by when they established the space agency. They didn't just pursue astronauts immediately. First, they actually pursued satellites. They made their own satellites. And they... Yeah. They launched their own satellites with Emirati crew involved in every stage of the process. Mm. That was one sign. Then there was another sign, which is when they had, yeah, yes, they accelerated his training because they wanted it to happen sooner, but they didn't skip anything that, 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 any, anything that made him more of an astronaut, they did. Anything that made him train more, they did. Anything that made it more science related, they did. On top of the stuff, they, they requested from the ISS, which, which research are we allowed to participate in? We want him to participate in space. Mm. And on top of that, they let him do certain experiments and they let him, you know, film certain things for, you know, outreach and all that. As on top of all that, they even brought with him experiments from the UAE and and uh children's experiments to test and all these things so they gave him the role of what it is to be an astronaut and to me that's that says that the uae was serious that they didn't want to just go to space they wanted to be astronauts they wanted to participate they wanted to be part of the next generation of space flight which is a big deal because that's the future of humanity in my opinion not just generally space flight but the idea that Moving forward, the countries that are involved in space are the ones that are going to be respected and seen as participating in the forefront of technology. So, whereas oil now is dominance, that's going to fade away. And we need to establish ourselves in this growing world of what is respected on an international scale, you know? So that's what I appreciate about the UAE putting the work in because mm -hmm. the work shows. And the proof that the work shows is that they recently signed a contract with NASA where NASA said, we'll train your astronauts. So they definitely will be astronauts. No more spaceflight participant, no more any of that. Right, right, right. Because now they're going to be put through EVA training. They're going to actually do spacewalks. They're going to do um, flights in in the T-38, which is a fighter jet that the, the astronauts use to train. Okay. These are all things NASA is going to do with the Emirat, um, Emirati astronauts, because there's four now. One of them is a girl as well, so that's mm. great. Um, they are doing this, and in my opinion, that's proof that they proved themselves to the United States and NASA that we are serious about space. We're not just doing it for PR or to be the first Arabs or anything like that. Which, if, even if they did do that, that's a side tangent to the focus which is we actually want to stay in this space we don't want to do it one time and be done with it you know what i mean yeah i know makes sense uh, that's something that i think is 
very important is the difference between you know hatta the ones that go to the ISS sometimes don't get the credit of astronaut whereas someone like Jeff Bezos or Richard Branson is like yeah I'm an astronaut now you can say it as a joke sure but people who like me I will never be able to see that and I personally and he, it's to the point where there's even uh you know there's a sweepstakes now for Virgin Galactic to go into space mm. on one of their tickets you just pay like um you just donate to Omaz and and they'll like put oh yeah yeah it's a it's a sweepstakes yeah and I didn't do it and I don't want to do it a lot of people sent it to me and I'm kind of like on the fence I'm like to be honest no cuz you know I don't just want to be a space flight participant or a space tourist and I'm afraid that even if I get selected as cool as those 6 minutes in space would be I would feel like when I came back everything would be about okay you already finished your goal you got to space you did what you wanted yeah 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 or or I don't want to be mm-hmm. defined by that I want to be defined by being an astronaut and as much as I want to go to space that isn't my ultimate goal my ultimate goal is to be an astronaut does that make yeah, sense yeah I know it does yeah but uh, yeah I want to bring a couple of points here cuz I mean before we started we were talking about you know how you know limarat sawa talash and what sawa what stopping gas and what not so that's i mean you kind of answered it's so complex man like yeah. i mean in kuwait we literally fail at the most basic stuff here as far as like khalas muamala bil hukuma still like it's still you know i mean i'm i'm doing well, that now chase. yeah and that's a simple that's that's as simple of a problem as it gets so your problem is a bit more complex i'm not sure if we i'm, I'm sure we have that brain for it if we want to but i feel like the the, the focus of the focus of you know everyday life isn't necessarily uh, putting us on the ranks of what's respected internationally i think we sh- we're, we're we're basically it's, it's almost like you know having too much tasks small tasks mm. that you never do anything important you just finish the small tasks but also on the other hand you know should we i mean with the whole jeff bezos thing there's there's there is a moral issue with it being saying like we have enough problems on earth why can't we use all the resources whether sure. it's people or money for earth. for earth first and then start exploring like how important is it to actually explore the space versus feeding people in africa you know what i mean gotcha that's a very good point and i think the answer is why not both um jeff bezos is a bad example because he's a billionaire richest person on earth and arguably like you know not liked by a lot of people yeah and that's because it seems like he can do much more than he's doing mm. which you know whether he agrees or or not i think is not for him to say um a lot of people think just being a billionaire is immoral um you know even if you achieve that kind of wealth people expect you to do something with it yeah and instead of hoarding and i think that um in my opinion that moral dilemma is important and it's something that gets brought up a lot but the truth is there are so many things that we do in our everyday life that came from space exploration even the phone that you're holding in your hands is from space exploration gps space exploration mm-hmm. satellites television all of the stuff space exploration all of these are the results of our knowledge in space even some of the components and things that went into mris space exploration So there's so many things and offshoots of technologies and a lot of it is stuff that NASA provides free and they do this research and they give it for free because it's basically um this is one of the ways that humans expand our knowledge. And I agree that you know if we have all this money why spend it on NASA or space or whatever. But the truth is if you look at their budget it's not even that much. And he, in terms of relative to the US budget method if we look at the US uh NASA's budget doesn't compare to method and the military budget yeah and if we want to talk about things that we should eradicate why don't we eradicate the the war efforts all around the world that are spending so much money to kill pretty much right. why don't we use that energy and that money towards everything else and you know, America has an infrastructure problem could be solved like that because of the money that they could easily redivert mm. you know and you're talking about a couple of percents from the military budget is how many billions yeah, you yeah. know so i'm i'm saying that these things are all important in my opinion space exploration is important 
for exploration in general is part of the human spirit mm. and on top of that the stuff that we gain out of it is essential because we learn more we learn more about everything in our life and we gain the knowledge to make more things that we need um the other problem is why so, well how does that explain why don't we solve you know the issues that we have like i said jeff bezos richard branson bad examples because they're commercial and they have a lot of money and they're just doing it and it looked bad when two billionaires left the earth yeah. within a week and it's like well these guys you know bez that doesn't i feel like also i feel bad because like it's cool and it's good for space in general when they did that but it's bad because it reflects badly on all the people who are working tirelessly to make the earth a better place through space mm. and look at all the the research like i said there's thousands of experiments that happen on the iss majority of them are earth-based mm. you know they're focused on earth in my opinion these are all things that any of all the things to get mad about in my opinion there are other things to to be mad about that we can take care of uh that allow us to take care of the poor allow us to take care of the hungry allow us to take care of everyone you know yeah okay. any if you're talking about all the money that's on earth there's enough to do this and extra this is being hoarded yeah 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 and it's being used in in the the worst of ways sometimes so the question isn't why space the question is why war why politics and lobbying why um the infighting and proxy wars that people fight for dominance in regions why you know what i mean like why all this stuff why can't we just contribute to stuff and that's why i think it's important also for the human spirit like i said for people the further we go from space the more we focus on being humanity and earth as opposed mm. to countries with different political agendas and all of that stuff because in the end of the day when it comes to space you have to cooperate that's the most important thing and yeah 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 so you know what i'm saying so for me that's that's the answer to that it's it's a very important question and i think it it gets mentioned a lot and sometimes it feels that way and that, well like why are we so focused on terraforming mars we're not some people are sure maybe elon musk wants to sure but that doesn't mean we want to leave earth behind and i think the most important thing we should all be talking about is climate change because especially in kuwait in 50 years it's going to be uninhabitable to live here it's going to be too hot 50 years only even less maybe oh wow it's going to be hot soon the average temperature of the earth is increasing every year and there's nothing we're doing to stop it and even the stuff that we do on an individual basis does nothing compared to the companies and the and the, mm. the commercialism that's killing everything, you know? So I think that there are bigger issues that we need to focus on. Space is, is in my opinion, one of the rays of hope that people have that for some reason, you know, yeah, it does cost some money. But then when people talk money, it's like, let's squash the one piece of hope. It's like, how about we squash all the other problems? Right, 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 right. Yeah. No, you fair know? enough. Yeah, I think. Yeah, that's fair enough. So, okay, just to compare, how much does it, I mean, Emirates are all high. How much does it cost them? I don't know what the Emirates Like, are we talking billions or are we talking millions? Um, Multiple millions, hundreds of millions. So, it depends. I, I'm not saying what the UAE did. And to be honest, like I said, they did a different approach. They didn't do let's get astronauts, let's pay for astronauts, let's just pay to send someone. They set up the foundation for a space agency. That's different. That's That takes more work, more money. Okay, so yeah. let's say, let's do the simple version then. Let's say we want to send you to... Um, if you want space. to send me... How much would it cost the country to actually send you and then be respected in some some way or another? You know, we send somebody. Yeah, it would, it would cost anywhere between 50 to... 200 million us for one person yep okay with their training and everything now when you pitch that what exactly is the benefit other than being respected for kuwait yeah so for kuwait i think personally it puts us it gives us a foot in the door on the mm. national scale so that's kind of what the uae did and in my opinion if we're going to do this maybe we go through the uae or through nasa or through roscosmos as a kuwaiti astronaut on their core so you're you're basically participating the way the european space agency how they take you know a german astronaut a french astronaut you know but in the end of the day they're european space agency astronauts but they represent their country so maybe we could do something like that mm -hmm. and aside from the respect and recognition that that gets the country and all that i think what it does most importantly is 
put our foot in the door for negotiations when it comes to space, allows us to talk to the people that we want to talk to, allows us to be in the same room with these people, and it sets up our future in terms of the youth and the next generation. When they see, representation is really important, when they see someone like them or someone from their country achieving or going to, to places where they think, you know, there is benefit that helps our entire generation one of the issues we have in kuwait is that we spend so much money sending all of our youth on betat and it's amazing most countries don't have it you go to the u.s most students are in debt mm. most of them are in debt till their 40s yeah that's a huge problem for us alhamdulillah we don't have that problem our country provides that for us and it's an amazing amazing thing that's a huge benefit and an accolade for kuwait What's the issue? The issue is these people come back with degrees and knowledge and know-how and they can't do much with that information. They're, they're met with barriers at different fronts. Sure. Whenever they try something, there's a barrier. Even setting up a company, as you, I'm sure you know, has barriers. Mm. There's so many issues and the problem is these barriers to entry are not sensical. You know, they, they don't make that much sense. A lot of them are just difficult for the sake of being difficult. Yeah. They don't, th this should be a process that helps you or l like let us help me help you, you know, help the country mm. progress. You know, like we came, we studied on Kuwaiti money to come back and help Kuwait. A lot of people ask me why I left Disney. Why did I want to come back to Kuwait? I hate that question. It's sad that we're in a place where people want to ask me that question. Right, right, right. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And he, I want to come home, first of all, and I want to contribute. I want to make it a better place. And that better doesn't mean what you have isn't great or it's not good. A lot of people think if you want to make things better, that means you're insulting what's already there. No. What's wrong with better? What's wrong mm. with progress? Yeah. You know? And we were one of the most progressive countries in the, in the region for a long time. Okay. And that's slowly going away. And for us, that's, that's something that's important to me is that when you come back, you have, you know, a purpose. A lot of people say, why are you coming to quit? There's any, you know, you, in my opinion, if I stay in America, I'm one in 500 million. We're all doing very similar things. A lot of people used to go to America because it was the land of opportunity. Mm -hmm. So you hear that a lot. Best. Kuwait is a land of opportunity now. America isn't as much. If you're an individual in America, it's hard. It's a lot harder for you to do things. But in Kuwait, the fact that there's you know mafi chidi, mafi chidi, that means that there's an opportunity to make it happen. Mm. And when I say I want to be the first Kuwaiti astronaut, I hope that's true. If I'm not, I'm okay with it. As long as I what I'm doing establishes the foundation for someone in the future to be the Kuwaiti astronaut. But when I say that. I say it with the hope that I might be and with the thought of, you know, when you were saying before with how do you not give up or with the barriers mm -hmm. to entry, for me, it, I, the way I think, think of it is someone has to be, yeah. eventually, someone has to be the first Kuwaiti astronaut. Sure, yeah. Why not me? And if it's not me, why not help make it happen, you know? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So for me, the idea of coming back to your country and contributing and making it a, a better place is fundamental to the whole point that we send people. We're paying money to send people to learn these things. Yeah, then, yeah, yeah. Then they come back and we're not giving them the foundation to, to grow. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's sad in a sense because and I always joke with my friends. I say, in my opinion, Kuwait could be like Wakanda from the MCU, from Marvel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's a small country. We can solve our problems very, very efficiently yeah. if we use the right resources. And it's, it could be a shining beacon. I, could, I think, like, honestly, Kuwait has some of the most potential in the world for any country. Any country. But mm. it's a matter of achieving that potential. It's a matter of... Um, not standing in the way of people who, you know, have the drive. And I'm not just talking about me. You know, I have one specific goal, sure. But I know, I know a lot of creative people and a lot of smart people who have so much drive and so much passion to make Kuwait a better place. Mm -hmm. 
But I feel like they don't have a, a stage. They don't have a foundation. Definitely, yeah. And that's not all on the com- on on the country or the government. Any, this is not just a, this is not a criticism of our country. You know, this is also a criticism of us. Any, we have to change our thaqafatna uh, and our culture, not our culture like our roots. No, our the, our way of thinking. What's good enough? You know, what is what is like our goal to what do we want to get out of our life is it is do you just want to stay hot in kuwait every summer and right, right, right. and just you know complain all the time about traffic or or do you want to live in a place that's thriving that you you love you know because we all love it but, but i feel like nobody's sacrificing for it or doing for it no yeah and to be honest with you any maybe maybe with climate change and maybe with oil not being the primary thing that people want in the in the world because it's not about when oil runs out it's about when oil is no longer needed mm-hmm. and maybe Kuwait could survive as a country without those things but definitely not on the lifestyle that we live today yeah 100%, we enjoy yeah. a very high lifestyle and if you want to keep that you want to sustain that lifestyle you you're going to need to do a lot of work up front and i i think it's fine i don't think having you know have that we're privileged we have a lot of things going for us in kuwait we have a great like community in general mm. that's if we don't if you want to keep that if you want to keep living like that mm. with the luxury with the with the with the ease the comfort that we have something has changed because we need to make uh, take the moves to make these things change otherwise we're going to not i'm not talking about like even without other countries advancing even without us not advancing simply climate change climate change and um oil being not the primary important resource on earth are going to be very detrimental for our society so i think these are things that are huge for us to consider moving forward mm, yeah no it makes makes a lot of sense but Do you think I mean money aside if I were to put you in a room with someone who can actually you know gives you the 100 million and like hey go do it fine mm-hmm. how much of it is a the uh, how much of of that being you know they reject you versus they don't actually understand that you have this thing that you're trying to pursue because I mean for me personally and I I'm I'm, I'm not the most you know ed- educated person in Kuwait obviously But I have no idea what space is like. Okay, I hear it, but in the news, but I never fully like. Oh, we can actually do it, you know? Why well, I don't get the benefits? That's why I'm asking you all these questions. Mm-hmm. How much of it is branding, and how much of it is uh, no? We decided, we looked into it, and we decided. I feel like a lot of it's just well, no one brought it up before. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. Um, part of the problem is awareness, and that's something that ignition we try to do. Uh, mm-hmm. Ignition is my. Uh, I'm a co-founder in, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. in the space exploration company. So we do a lot of tawiyah, which is just like awareness for the youth and the people in general about what is space, what is this. And it's not just this elusive thing, you know. It, it's a, it's a thing that we can participate in, and mm-hmm. it has a role. And I think that's something that's important to us. But then on top of that, like you said, like sitting in a room asking for that, it's not just about money. It's it's also about like the 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 damn not financial but like the actual standing by like this is what we want to do, this is an official government you know move that we're trying to move towards space. Um, it's not just about convincing you know let's ha- make it do it one time. No, we want to we want to participate the way that I said like Methan UAE proved that they were trying to participate. I think in terms of You know, getting people to care—that's what I think is important about getting a Kuwaiti in space. Why care if there's no Kuwaitis in space? Why would you care about space if you never, if if it, yeah. if no one you know has ever been to space? But if if a Kuwaiti that you know has been to space talks about it, uses that to share the experience mm. with everyone, it's kind of like when Kuwaitis go to the Olympics. Yeah, or, I mean, yeah, Kuwaiti, people get excited about it. Yeah, not not just excited. You feel like you're in the Olympics. Right. Oh, it's yes, like when yes. it's like when your favorite soccer team or f- football team. Mm. <laughs> uh, it's it's like when your favorite football team wins. You feel like you won. It's a sense of community that that the world has. We have this in our humanities that we 
we have like a tribal, we align ourselves with communities. So if you believe that you're part of a team, you feel like you're one even if you didn't play, you know? Yeah, I know what you mean, yeah. Fe, we all win if if we achieve those goals. And to be honest with you, it's considered. Any One of the roles, and when I was talking to Chris Hemsworth, uh, Chris Hemsworth. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> it's early. It's, it's early for me. When I was talking to Chris Hadfield about, uh, about you know, the role of an astronaut, yeah. he was saying, you know, even if you're not someone who's publicly, you know, like loves to be in the spotlight and all that stuff, part of your job requires you to be and you get training. And he personally wanted his pers- his public speaking to be better, and he he sought out courses and in public speaking. Okay. Because it's part of your responsibility responsibility as an astronaut to um, have that public image. Sure. Yeah. Definitely. Whether you like it or not, you're going to get it. So yeah. so you need to. People are going to look up to you. You need to um, be able to represent your country, be able to represent your your culture, and be able to represent science. These are all yeah. very important things. Definitely, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's all part of the awareness. And like I said, I think for us, it's a question of thaqafa and like changing what we care about and the things that we care about. Uh, I believe, you know, what's the benefit for sending game? If I give you what's the benefit if I sent you right now to space, mm. what do we get out of it? You get people caring about things more than just, you know, their day-to-day here and sometimes the problems that we're facing here it gives a ray of hope and a, and a chance for us to say what what if we can do better people are going to think i can raise my kids to be kuwaiti astronauts if i wanted the same way we could think of them as being engineers or doctors mm-hmm. are the two main things so yeah, you, yeah you grow up and you're like doctor or muhandis yeah so? yeah which is something that people like push on others which is not a good thing in general but aside from that it's it's something that people look up to and they want people to become but we need more options and in the aerospace engineering it's oh. considered by kuwait not important non-essential we don't need it why because there's nothing in kuwait for it and if you want to do a bit yeah, yeah, aerospace yeah. so that's that's you know the things that we need to change and there's nothing wrong with studying aerospace if you give someone the opportunity to do something with it yeah definitely now how about like i mean you've been mentioning how you know like it seems that the public sector plays a huge role in in sen- making astronauts but why where is the private sector like i mean it seems that there is a lot of marketing there if yes. i send you as a company yeah woo. so that's the other thing that we're talking about benefit that people don't talk about you can make money off space I'm explain, say, okay. I want to say that loud and clear yeah, explain this for people uh, who think that it's just a waste of money. Um, a lot of the things in your day-to-day, mm. things that we take for granted all the time, are made of resources. And the batteries on our phones are lithium-ion. That lithium is mined all around the world. You know, Everything we use is materials that are extracted from the earth. And the different materials allow us to do different things. One of the huge, huge opportunities in space is mining, space mining, as in mining um, meteors and comets, Mm. stuff like that, meteorites. So we can use these new resources on Earth to create different things Mm. as we learn more about them. And aside from that, there's a business involved in launching rockets. And if you look at SpaceX, they revolutionized the the space industry right now because what they did was they made rockets more affordable they started doing for the first time for people who don't know what spacex is doing they started doing reusable rockets which is unheard of it used to be a waste every time you use a rocket it's done it's broken it's ruined they made reusable rockets that land like themselves right right that's a huge huge advantage because then you can send multiple rockets for cheaper Mm. that's what spacex innovated now the private sector is new. For for a long time, space was considered only public sector and mm-hmm. government around the world. This is because of the implications of ICBMs and like intercont- intercontinental ballistic missiles. So basically, <clears throat> the technology that is required to make get you access to space 
is what gives you access to nuclear bombs and and the ability to attack other countries. Mm. So so for that reason, it's always been a government thing first. But they've recently allowed commercial entities to be involved, and because of that. SpaceX, Blue Origin, Virgin Galactic have all been commercializing space. Yeah. And this is a huge opportunity because it allows, you know, things move faster in commercial sectors than government generally. So so that's allowed for a lot of progress in general. But the opportunities to make money off of space are huge. Mm. And that's the reason it's uh, the other reason it's good to participate, to be there and present in that, you know, echelon of, of industry. Yeah, no, definitely. You just why don't you like take donations? I mean, if it's only fifty million, like GoFundMe or something, you know. I'm sure a lot of people would. I mean, why not? Because I mean, you see people like when when Montaigne, for example, he was Khalid. It's like people go nuts. They spend a lot of money buying T-shirts and whatnot. You know? Yeah. So it seems like I mean, if you're you can bet on that, like tribal thing, like oh, we're gonna send. Uh, come on, I will send. I will send him. Yeah, I, that's true. I like I I never considered that, but maybe it'll. Res- I'll result to you know I'll re- have to do that eventually but I think any a part of me just wants to do it with the government you know what I mean yeah yeah any I want to represent Kuwait I want to I want to you know, yeah it can be a team effort and everyone can pitch in and stuff and sure even if I had the money myself I would want to do it with the government maybe I'll pay some I don't mind mm. it's not about that it's a, the money is just an obstacle and to be honest you know, we're talking about a different level of money right we're talking and you know, we're talking hundreds of millions and stuff that's within the realm of space is not a lot of money mm. within the realm of country money that's not a lot it's of not, money no. you see what I'm saying yeah and you know, we're talking for us that's a lot of money for individuals it's a whole thing yeah. spend that much to go to space But for for governments, that shouldn't be a lot of money. If it mm-hmm. is, you have a problem. <laughs> you know, it, like the, that's that's just a matter of priority. And it's been brought up. And Dr. Basam Al Faili is someone who's been pushing for a national corps and a space agency in Kuwait for like at least 15 years. And uh, you know, it's his proposals have sometimes been described as rafahia, like it's a luxury we don't need. And that's something that. You know, doesn't make sense because, in my opinion, when you're doing, like, you, all you have to do is tweak a couple of things to make that happen. Think about how much money br- Kuwait brings in with oil daily. You can solve this very easily. You know. Yeah. For, for for me, it's not about the money; it's about the stamp of approval from the government saying this is our person that this we're is, sending. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is who we're sending. I could I could pay and go with Russia. Technically, I'd be the first Kuwaiti because I'm a Kuwaiti person who went to space. But I want the government to be proud of me. I want I want to represent them. I want right, right, right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. It's a it's a question of why not? Like, why not? I mean, yeah, I don't have an answer. That's yeah, that's a good question. Uh, okay, so based. Okay, so let let's really back. I, I went really deep into space. It's just interesting. And yeah, I mean, sorry if this is a little no, heavy for no, no, for the no, podcast, but no, it's, uh, it's it's uh, like you said. There's a lot of people who don't know about definitely, the yeah. season. Yeah, I mean. I mean, I'm t- I'm 27, and then I barely. I mean, I knew like 10% of the information you told me. Mm. Uh, but okay, let's back up now to one of the things you mentioned. I mean, you have uh, so you have two companies. You have Ignition, which trying to you know space space focused in Kuwait, but then you have uh, the Invisible Ink, mm-hmm. which you make a uh, filmmaking, and then you like stories. Mm-hmm. So without you know without burning your craft, how do you write a good story? So Cause there is everybody when you Google it's like oh you know ending middle me I'm like okay fine yeah tell me the actual like that's everybody can do that but then how Fair do you refine you want me to give you uh, from my experience what I think makes a story yeah okay so you don't want the you know, I mean three uh, act you, structure you have to follow that <laughs> but then like what's yes, in it you know yes, what I mean exactly so there there is a structure that that most good stories are built around mm. and that's something that needs to happen. Or if you make a good movie, it'll fit the structure. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? I had to, if you didn't know you were doing it, if you made a good movie, it'll fit structure. Because structure is what drives our, uh, and logic is what drives our, our being. And in humans, we have this um, inclination towards logic. Mm. So the stuff that's 
that that makes sense that has payoff is what we find enjoyable when it comes to movies. In my opinion, what makes a good story is authenticity and having something to say. And we're saying not just with movies, any you know, because I have a background in Disney. Storytelling was in everything we did. It dictates everything. So the point of having a good story and the reason why it's important to have a good story before we define like what is a good story, the reason it's important to have one is because it controls your entire story and everything in it, the world that you're building. Mm-hmm. And then when we were at Disney, when we're deciding, you know, what should this handrail look like? Well, what is this handrail? Is it a handrail that's here in the theme park or is it a handrail that's here in this world that we're building for the people to use? You know, and he, what what has this handrail been through? Is it has it been through the environment that this has been through? Because this has been through hell. So maybe the handrail should look like hell. You know what I mean? And there should be um, every decision you make is tied to the story. Okay. So th- what makes a good story? I believe it's authenticity. I believe it's having something worth sharing, whether it's, you know, and you wanting people to experience an experience or whether it's wanting people to know of how something happened. But I think what makes a good story is those elements combined with great characters. People don't like watching perfect characters. I think that one of the flaws that we make as storytellers is as soon as we start writing down, you know, who's our main character, start writing the coolest person ever, you know, and you just think of like the best things that make them an awesome person. Yeah. Because they have no flaws. And the truth is the world has flaws and people have flaws. We have flaws. We all have flaws. So when we watch movies, we like to see flawed characters because we feel like we see ourselves in them. Yeah. And in Methan, if you look at Captain America and Marvel, uh, the Marvel movies, uh, the directors of Captain America 2 don't like that his character is too clean and too po- perfect and too polished. Mm-hmm. But that's kind of his character. So what do you do? So what they made was they put this perfect person, quote unquote, in a situation that that he doesn't like. Mm-hmm. And his flaw is that he can't adapt to that situation. Mm-hmm. So they made him more flawed by by making his and he became this person who strives for the good but can't live without the bad. That makes a more interesting character. So in my opinion, what makes um, a movie or a story uh, good is an authentic uh, authentic take mm. on something you're trying to say, whether it's a story or whether it's just an emotion, an expression, whatever it is, because some movies are more abstract. But the point is. You're you're showing something authentic about yourself and the way you you perceive the world, mm. and you have good vehicles to get you there, like characters or settings, right. or you know, all of those things serve the story. Like all of the mm. this, the character, the there's a theme that has to happen. I guess is that one way to tie it up. When you yeah. have a theme, the theme is the overall arching like. Um, thing you're trying to say that seeps into everything in your story yeah because the hardest thing for me when i think about writing a story i mean i do a lot of commercials but they're not necessarily stories because they're like 30 seconds you can still tell a story but it's really hard to communicate the purpose of the story yeah and, i mean like 99 percent of the ideas actually have no purpose it's just fun yeah and to make it relevant and important and worth your time you i mean a lot of it you just inject a purpose that's not related to yeah but how do you find the purpose of whatever you're writing? Is it is it's such a hard thing? Like you have to think. Yeah. I mean, a big. I mean, I don't know how you do it, but I would think you spend a lot of time just thinking. Yeah. Which a lot of people don't want to do. It. Like, oh, we're going to shoot tomorrow, right? Yeah. Sorry. Yep. yep. Bring, I want to do it now. Yeah. I was. I mentioned earlier when we were talking that you know a lot of ads, especially in Kuwait, don't have a lot of story. Mm. The best ads have story, even if the purpose is to to sell something you sell it in a way that's entertaining or in a way that, you know, if the point is to make you laugh, make someone laugh. If the point is to um, make people think, make them think. But the but what I see is that with ads, you know, a lot of people, especially like clients nowadays, they'll be like, oh, yeah, it's only 30 seconds. Mm. That's so much harder than five minutes. I have to tell the whole story in 30 seconds. You know what I mean? Yeah. I have to make an impression in 30 seconds. There's a complete different 
perspective on that compared to you know they think oh it's 30 seconds it's not a big deal it should be cheaper etc 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 but really it's like no that makes it more difficult and i think that um when it comes to what you're saying about you know how do you go about coming up with these things like how do you know how do you put that into the story like how do you understand um how do i put it what what is the purpose of what i'm trying to say here mm. It's basically, in my opinion, it comes down to the the reason you're making the movie, or the reason. If you're making it just to tell a story, for the sake of telling a story, you're gonna have some trouble. Yeah, 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 yeah. But if you if you have something you want to say, or express, the truth is, if you look at different art and different media, um, you'll find that it's rarely the the topic that's the issue. It's always how. So everything can be done in a good way mm-hmm. or it can be done in a bad way. Mm-hmm. Even sometimes you get the same movie twice, like Suicide Squad, where it's yeah, like, yeah. you know, one that's approached in a bad way, one is approached in a better way. Some people might not like the newer one, but it it, it knows what it wants to be and it mm. goes for it. You know what I mean? There's yeah, a difference yeah, yeah. between that and something that doesn't know what it is and is trying to be other things. Yeah, no, I understand. But yeah. there's, there's a difference there. In my opinion, it comes down to Understanding clearly what you want to say. What what are we saying with this story? Mm. What do I want someone who's watching it to take away from it? Right. And the thing is, there's real value there. Yanni, think about how many fictional stories people get attached to. That's how you know you wrote a good story. People cry over movies about things that don't exist, if you think about it. Yeah. You know, because that, that's not the point. That what's real is the experience of going through it or the idea that people go through it right yeah and that that it transcends you know the fact that what you're watching is fake because it's not about whether it's real or not it's about the context and that the reality of the human condition in that context hmm. like what if i was in this situation it would suck and i would feel this way and it would feel sad and you know you so you empathize with people who don't exist but because you have empathy and it's an exercise of empathy. Yeah. I mean, even if you do all of that, I still struggle with the next step, which is commercializing the story. Uh, that's a bit harder. I was, I was watching a show, you know, Hot Ones, the ones where mm-hmm. they, uh, what's his name? Uh, Matt Damon. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he was talking about like, so he was asked, you know, like how, how the movies change. And then he was explaining that, you know, before you get revenue from movie theaters plus DVDs. So then you can explore ideas. Mm-hmm. Now it's only movie theater. Uh, so, and you know, there's no DVDs, obviously, there's no mm-hmm. revenue there. So then every movie you have to, have to, to have to appeal to a, a larger chunk of society. Mm-hmm. So then the movies get a bit, I don't want to say lame, but like they, they tame them down so that it's like, you know, they you, cater towards yeah, to yeah. everybody. Yeah. Everybody has to like this burger so that we sell enough to make money. So here, so I guess the same thing then, you know, in, in advertising where I work or even like short movies or even movies in Kuwait, it's just harder because you might create very good work, but then if only uh, a lot of the concern here is reach. Mm-hmm. If yeah, fine, this is the best piece I've seen a whole year, but it only got like two thousand views. Yeah, like good luck. You know, a client will not pay for that. Yeah, they I think want- I think the way you tackle this is uh, having a healthy mix. The same way you know, with a lot of things in life, you need balance. Mm. And I think that. Every director or every writer wants to write a story that has nothing to do with how much it will sell Mm. or what the studio thinks, and they just want to make what they want to make. There's always compromise. Directors are always compromising with the studio, and it depends on the type of director. I just recently finished a master class of uh, James Cameron, who did Avatar, Titanic, yeah, yeah. Terminator. So for me, he, he said, like, you know, he's big enough of a director that, like, when yeah. 20th Century Fox told them, we love the movie, Mon Avatar, but we don't like all this hippie crap that's in it. You know? Mm. All the hippie stuff about, like, Earth and, or the, you know, the planet and other, we, and can we tone it down this way? And he said no. He said, well, he's big enough to say no to 20th Century Fox. Yeah, so yeah, he definitely. can say, the reason I'm making this movie is the hippie stuff. Right, right, right. That's right. the only reason I wanted to make this. So if you don't like it, I can take it to a different studio. Yeah. You know? They're like, la, 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 it's cool. So I think the problem is 
a lot of these, it depends. Some directors don't mind being very commercial. Some of them are better at, at negotiating with their with mm-hmm. their studios. But then there are some who get squashed by the studios. Talk about a lot of a lot of times it happens with like a movie that people are looking forward to, and then just gets meddled meddled with, and then it becomes nothing. And then the and the director takes the credit, even if it's bad. And they're like, to be honest, I made a better movie because it didn't come out, you know. Yeah. And then and then there's some directors who take crap for a bit, and then they'll earn the right to say no. Yeah. Say no. And Christopher Nolan. He was always making crazy movies. And then he took something very commercial, Batman. Mm. Even Batman, he made it excellent. And with The Dark Knight, that's a movie that, you know, is not even, people don't even consider it a superhero movie. They consider it, you know, they don't even consider it a Batman movie. They consider it like a, a thriller, a political thriller with yeah, Joker yeah. in it because it's so well made. And then he proved himself to Warner Brothers so well that after that he can make Inception. A right. movie that would never get greenlit. Mm. No studio on earth would say yes to Inception. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no yeah. studio on earth would say yes to Interstellar. He makes the stuff he wants to make now because nobody says no to. Him, and and then somehow it. it makes money. Because that's what I was. Gonna, that's like the overarching point is that the reason it's important to do that and to fight the commercial side of things when you can is because in the end of the day, it doesn't matter if more people see it. Every movie or every piece of art that people care about is always the thing that that was the genuine expression, the 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 one that. And you know, what are your favorite movies? What are the favorite movies of people who watch movies? Sometimes they were commercial failures, but people love them because they were movies that that had like a cult following of like you know they became big in pop culture. Yeah, you know they're movies that if you look back in history, some of them the most famous movies in history. They they didn't do as well as people think they did. Mm. That's because they they were authentic. They reached out to the people who built a following around them. So I think in, in the end of the day, if you're being authentic, you're gonna get more loyal customers. That's why people go see Interstellar. That's why people go see Inception because they loved Batman and uh, he took he took a a risk, you know, working with commercial and all that. But after that, people like I'm like one of those people. I love Christopher Nolan. I don't care what he produces. Yeah, people, people went and saw Dunkirk. Dunkirk is not a movie for everyone. Mm-hmm. Dunkirk is a movie that some people will leave going wow, and some people will leave going I don't understand what was yeah. the story, what was going on. But it depends on the person. But my point is that there, the the people who think it's wow will always be down for Christopher Nolan movie, regardless of what it's about. Whereas the yeah, people yeah. who were like, what is going on? You know, they'll be back if it's big enough or they'll catch their attention more commercial, etc. Yeah. But I think commercialism is a good thing and it's good to have some edge. I think someone who does it really well is Marvel. If you look at their movies, they appeal to everyone, but they're they're also, yeah, in my opinion, they don't get enough credit for the actual great storytelling that they do. Mm. It's, they told... a a decade long arc that I don't think anybody has rivaled or can rival. It's really like, in my opinion, that's cinematic history now. Yeah, they, yeah, yeah. They did something that's never been done before and it works so well. And people who think it's not real, you know, film is just like theme park is too exciting. I disagree because I think that there's a lot more thought and, and concept and theme and, you know, philosophy in, in the movie, in, in the, in the entire series mm. then people give it credit for but mm. aside from that it's still superheroes and exciting yeah, and yeah, yeah. disney which is very disney does what disney does and, and like they're they're a corporate company so they basically always have that commercial side yeah definitely always. yeah 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 so i think in the end date comes down to a simple idea of trying to balance where where you can compromising where you can and and not compromising where you can't and Got basically you, okay. saying you know, I need to tell a story. Um, allow me to tell a story. And me and Ahmed in Invisible Ink, something that we do is we, we don't accept all our clients. Yeah. That's because a good Because for one, we, we open the business out of passion. You know, like it's something we are passionate about. So we only take the stuff that we are really passionate about. And when we do a project, 
there's obviously some, you know, back and forth with the client because they have a vision and they have a commercial side that they care about. But the whole point of coming to us is story. Mm. The whole point of coming to us is something different. If you want a typical ad, you can get a typical ad anywhere and it'll cost you less. Yeah. That's fine. If you came to us, you want something different. And that's what we're going to provide. Gotcha. So in my opinion, you know, it's one of those things that you got to judge uh, at all times. Like each case by case, you need to see where's the line of this makes no sense and it's just commercial or, oh, this is commercial, but I can add a little bit of this and that and it's cool in the end. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, okay. Before we wrap, it's like talking about commercializing stuff. So I want to go back to space because you, you, you went to Hawaii and then you did you, you, the simulation. Yeah. Did you call it analog simulation? Yeah. So is this, so if I want to, if I want to commercialize space tomorrow, I have money today. I'm like, I want to open a company tomorrow. I want to commercialize whatever easier to com- commercialize. And Can you create, I mean, you have the company and then I don't know if you're trying to do that or not, but can you create the simulation and quit? Yeah. Definitely. Is it, uh, and then what, what else could you, what sect, I mean, okay, maybe we'll never be able to like build, you know, rockets here, mm-hmm. but what parts of that chain yeah. can we commercialize and quit easily? Because I think when people, I mean, even the government, if you can tell them like, hey, this is good for the long run, good investment, but also makes money now, I feel like people might be like, okay, I'll consider, yeah, more I'll likely. listen to you. Yeah. But yeah. don't tell me something will make money in 20 years because like something like, no, I need no. Yeah, I got you. I think with the analog, at Ignition, one of our major projects is an analog mission. Mm. And we're trying to set up a Kuwaiti analog uh, facility in a station. And the idea is to create a simulation in Kuwait that's authentic to mars for example and allows us to test things like in my opinion you know still early on on that project but so we're basically trying our best to make sure it contributes something that other analogs don't have why so that you know the same way i traveled to the states and mm-hmm. one of our members recently is uh, headed towards poland to do one the same reason people are traveling there to go do the analogs i want people to travel to kuwait just to do an analog mm-hmm. I wanted to offer something that the other ones don't have. So if you want to do the one that has what we're offering and the 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 realism that we're going to offer, then you have to come to Kuwait. Okay. And I'll tell you what, like this is not an exaggeration. I've seen the the rovers on Mars take lots of photos, and Kuwait looks a lot like Mars. really like probably what? the two countries I think that look the most like Mars are Kuwait, our desert, and and uh jordan like the yeah near, yeah, yeah, near, yeah near petra and all that with the cliffs and the mountains that's the only thing we don't have but in terms of like a picture of the ground on mars it's just like Kuwait. wow fair i feel like if we have you know especially set up in winter a lot of people think mars is hot because it's red i don't know why <laughs> i was just gonna ask about that <laughs> but mars is really cold uh very very cold because it's 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 uh further from the sun so it's mm, it's makes sense. very cold and um if we set up a good analog mission in the desert here somewhere and you know during the winter we have like a proper setup we can get it to look pretty accurate and good enough to do scientific research and experimentation in because the point of the analog missions or simulations is to simulate life on the planets as a way to do an experiment but then Mm -hmm. when i was at high seas in hawaii we were simulating life on the moon. We were mm. up on a mountain and away from everyone and near like caves and lava tubes. And and basically, I took with me a medical research project that I um, collaborated with Serge Kuwait here where we got the doctors together and they trained me. Um, basically, the idea was like, how can you train a, a non-medical doctor astronaut in surgical procedures mm. so that if something were to happen on the moon or mars maybe even the doctor that's with them gets injured every astronaut has basic surgical understanding to solve certain problems mm. so they gave me some crash courses on like three procedures and i practiced them for like three weeks before uh, arriving at high seas yeah and then throughout the mission i simulated them on my on um, one of the crewmates who volunteered. Mm. So the idea was that I I learned medical procedures very recently and then I could perform them on mission. Gotcha. So that was the opportunity that an analog gave me. It wouldn't make sense. It'd be cool to learn it here and then just have the skill. 
but it's better to have the opportunity to pretend I'm somewhere mm. where I don't have help and I can't help ask for help and it's just me and the crew and I can in that moment I'm telling you like even while I was performing it I was nervous for some reason even though I know I'm not actually doing surgery on my friend yeah but I put a surgical pad on him and when I cut him he even said I felt like you were actually operating on me and it's because of the seriousness of the simulation we because we take the simulation we don't break sim which means we don't we don't do things that remind us that we're on earth mm. when we're in the simulation we pretend we're on a different planet or the moon for us it was the moon so even you know we only had two hours per day to communicate with earth with mm. capcom via email uh, we could only email and and we couldn't google things or use internet we had to request information that kind of stuff. You're writing updates every day and, and reaching out to family. So the idea is that you d mentally distance yourself and it's a very powerful and easily, like surprisingly easy to distance your mind from, from where you are. Yeah, I mean, just the simulation part of it, you could commercialize it even for normal people, like a, a day in, in space or whatever. Yeah, you could. Yeah, and that, could. That, that's just definitely sure. just money, printing money, sure. basically. It costs money to do an analog because yeah, yeah, yeah. that's... that's uh, income on its own but then on top of that yeah like you said like you know the in between missions you can just have people yeah it's like factories there. yeah and i don't mind so long as you clearly define where the science ends and where the science begins yeah. and he, one of the issues some um analogs that try to be too commercial have is that you know ta like hang out here and get a certificate that you're a you know like yeah. an authentic astronaut or whatever I, I need it. For me, it's very important, uh, the integrity that's related to science and whether you're doing science or whether you're doing something personal. For me, that's a big, a bi a big um, line that I don't want to cross. Like, I want to define what's science and mm. I want to define what's, you know, an experience that you paid for, which is fine. That's cool, too. But don't say it's science and don't say, you know, it's legitimate training. There's a difference. And two weeks in high seas was not easy. And it right, wasn't, right, right. and it wasn't um, just fun, you know. Like, hey, I'm going to. No, it was training. And when we were there, we treated it with that respect. So it's different that than you know, living in a moon for a day. Which yeah, is, yeah, I know. Which yeah. is cool too. You can offer that, but make it clear that it's not the same. Yeah, no, definitely. Okay. Yeah. So uh, before we go, uh, so what's next for you? And could you also like, can we plug you like where people can find you? Yeah, sure. So, so for me, inshallah, I'm I'm still working towards that astronaut goal. Mm. Um, right now, I feel ready. I'm I'm ready. You know, I have a recommendation from Chris Hadfield. I have um, aerospace engineering um, training. I have training in practical simulations and in actual astronaut stuff. And I'm ready. I just need support from the government, not just financial, actual you know backing to to help me get to where I want to go. I even reached out to, to other countries who are open to the suggestion because it has to be Shay Rasmi Mil Hakuma. Yeah. So these are things that, that I'm hoping, you know, if anybody if any of your listeners know anyone who yeah, is yeah. willing to listen, someone who has, you know, um the ability to make these kind of decisions, I'm down. Because that's my next step personally and I'm working towards it. On a personal growth level, I'm saving up some money right now to get my pilot license, private pilot license. Uh, we don't have that offered in Kuwait, so I have to either get it in the United States or in Europe. Yeah. Um, so that's something I'm working towards. And in terms of plugging, you can follow me at the Traveling Architect on Instagram, mm -hmm. the dot traveling dot architect. Yep. And um, if you're interested in film and VFX um, and storytelling, you can follow Invisible Inc on on Instagram. And if you're interested in space, you can follow Ignition. Kuwait on Instagram. Okay, perfect. Well, that's a show. Thank you.